I'm a singer, yes, sir. Five, four, three, two, one. Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter is the successor to X-Men vs. Street Fighter and was originally released in arcades in 1997. Visually, this game seems... Pff, actually, it seems identical to X-Men vs. Street Fighter to me. I'm sure there's some kind of visual difference here, but I don't think I'd notice it without comparing them directly side by side. The presentation and the menus and the sound design seem a little bit flashier, and it almost feels like the announcer yells way more in this game, too. But outside of that, I'd say that this is aesthetically X-Men vs. Versus Street Fighter again. As for gameplay, there are some changes, but fundamentally, the game still works like X-Men vs. Street Fighter with the tag outs, special moves, and team specials. The biggest mechanical change here is the addition of assist attacks, which allow you to have your partner dole out an attack without actually tagging them in. You could kinda sorta do this with the team supers in the last game, but this time around, it's more of a standard support attack. Because the focus is now on Marvel heroes at large, most of the X-Men characters were cut, leaving only Cyclops and Wolverine on this game's roster. We do have a bunch of new, iconic Marvel characters though, including Spider-Man, the Hulk, and weirdly, Shuma Gorath. On the Street Fighter side, the roster only changed a little bit, with Charlie and Cammy replaced by Dan and Sakura. Overall, this is still a pretty solid roster, though the Marvel side leaves a bit to be desired given that it's entirely made up of men. It would have been nice if they brought over someone like Storm or Rogue from the previous game, but I digress. When selecting a character, there's a couple of additional options. The option for Standard or Turbo Mode has been brought forward from the normal Street Fighter games, but also the option to choose between manual mode, which is the standard control inputs, and easy mode, a super simplified input mode that allows you to use combos and special moves by essentially just button mashing. You can pull out a lot more moves a lot more quickly if you're someone like me who isn't great at consistently using the moves that you want, and this can feel super powerful, but it also leads to a pretty significant loss of control. I tried it for a couple of rounds and decided that I actually prefer manual controls. Glad the option's here though. Moving through the arcade mode, it feels very similar to the last game up until the very end. This time you do still fight Apocalypse and the fight is really similar. I still really like how this boss is done though and it still feels really climactic to fight him. However, a key difference between this and the last game is that rather than pitting you against your partner, you're instead put into one final boss fight against a super powerful Cyber Akuma. Listen, I don't know the lore or anything behind why he's Cyber Akuma here, but I do think this design is really corny, but in a good way. Also, so this fight is ridiculously hard, but by this point in the video I should have known that an Akuma fight is gonna be hard. Unfortunately, you do still only get the ending of the character who dealt the final blow against Akuma, meaning that if you want to see both characters' endings, you've gotta redo the whole thing again. Outside of the addition of a handful of secret characters, that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of under-the-hood mechanical changes that are way beyond my understanding, but as a casual player, I don't really feel much of a difference between this game and the last one. At the end of the day, it feels almost like the crossover version of the updated arcade releases that we see in the normal numbered titles. The game's mechanics and balance have clearly been adjusted and the roster is totally revamped, but it still feels like it was just built on top of X-Men vs. Street Fighter. While this is the last Marvel crossover game in this video, this game and the previous one are actually the precursors to the Marvel vs. Capcom games. While I won't be covering those in this video, I do plan on eventually making a whole dedicated Marvel vs. Capcom video, so keep an eye out for that. Street Fighter EX2 was originally released in arcades in 1998 and, like the first game, got an updated release in 1999. I'll be playing the updated PlayStation release. Visually, this game seems pretty similar to the first, but if you look a little closer, it actually made a pretty hefty visual leap forward. The character models are significantly less blocky, and honestly, the designs look better too. But that's not the most important improvement. The stage backgrounds now all have SOME kind of dynamic or animated element. They're still flat images, of course, but they're animated flat images, which actually makes a huge difference. This is a bunch of small visual improvements, but together they add up to make a much better looking game. As for the gameplay, this is incredibly similar to the first EX outside of a couple of new additions. The most prominent new one is the XL combo feature, which is, from what I can tell, just the custom combo feature from the alpha games. You can use some of your special meter to activate this mode, and it lets you pull out insanely rapid combos for a couple of seconds. Outside of XL combos, there's some more small additions and guard breaks 
Freaks, which are unblockable attacks at the cost of some of your super gauge, and the ability to cancel supers into other supers. This game still feels decent to play, and for all intents and purposes, it's a 2D Street Fighter game with 3D characters. Speaking of characters, the roster's been expanded and now includes a couple of classic characters like Blanca, along with some new original characters with cool names like Shadow Geist, Volcano Rosso, and, uh, Area? Arcade mode works the same way that we saw it in the first EX, but with the addition of two bonus stages. In the first, you have to defeat the dummy enemy within the time limit using only Excel combo moves. This one's kinda challenging because not only is there a time limit, you're also limited in how many times you can activate the Excel combos. In the second bonus stage, you're trying to break a falling satellite within the time limit while trying to either destroy or avoid the meteors hurling down. Completing these bonus stages not only increases your overall score, but also gives you a special bonus for the next battle, like unrestricted uses of the Excel combo for an entire match. Unfortunately though, the cool pre-rendered endings are not here in this game, and instead you just get a bit of a freeze frame replay and some text. That's kind of a bummer. This game brings back the Expert Practice mode, but this time it's renamed to Trial mode and has two difficulty options, Expert and an unlockable Maniac mode. The Expert mode is the same as the last games, you perform a series of increasingly complicated moves. Maniac mode though is one single challenge, defeat the enemy with a single combo. I'm gonna be honest, I am nowhere near good enough at these games to properly beat Maniac mode, and now I see why it's unlockable. The bonus game mode allows you to play both of the bonus stage games from the arcade mode and the barrel stage from the last game with any character you want. Finally, there's director mode. This is the watch mode from the last game, but super expanded, and unlike the watch mode, I can actually see people wanting to use this mode. The way it works is that you can pick any two characters and record your moves. Then you can save the recording to your memory card and edit the camera almost frame by frame to do cool cinematic focuses during the replay. These camera moves and angles can then be saved as a customized replay on any stage in the game. This is pretty primitive, but super neat, and I can definitely see someone back in the day finding a really cool combo and wanting to save a neat video of it. So, Street Fighter EX2 is, like basically every game I've talked about so far, an incremental improvement to what came before. This game's not doing anything radically different from EX, but it is building on EX to create an overall better experience. So far though, the EX games still don't feel like they do enough to make me think they stand out against, I don't know, one of the main numbered titles or even Alpha. Street Fighter Alpha 3 was released in arcades in 1999 and is the final Street Fighter Alpha game. Visually, the in-game style is similar to previous Alpha games, but as far as the presentation goes, this game looks a bit different for some reason. There was a pretty defined and set in stone style in the last two when it came to like the character artwork and the style of the interface and transitions, so I'm not sure what happened to cause them to change it. It doesn't look bad or anything, and in fact it actually looks pretty good. It's just weirdly distinct from the other two, as if almost they wanted to pivot away from the previous aesthetic. The super smooth transitions are still intact though, which is my favorite trademark of the alpha game, so I'm still satisfied. Gameplay wise, there's also a sort of departure here in that you now have to select one of three isms when you select your character, which I'm just gonna call them modes. The modes are A-ism, V-ism, and X-ism. These modes change the game mechanics for your specific character to be more similar to a previous games. A-ism matches Street Fighter Alpha, V-ism matches Street Fighter Alpha 2, and X-ism matches Super Street Street Fighter 2 Turbo. So with Xisms, for example, you don't get air blocking or alpha counters and you only have one super combo, but in exchange you get more powerful moves in general. I personally think that having all of these choices is really cool, albeit a bit redundant. Like I've mentioned earlier, these games all feel like iterative changes upon each other, but still feel incredibly similar overall when you look at the big picture. It's like that iterative concept was taken and just crammed into a single game. There's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think this feature is something that would appeal to a casual player like me who probably can't tell much of a difference between Alpha 1 and 2's game mechanics. I do want to give it credit though, they actually went out of their way to change some of the visuals to match which mode you're using, like Chun-Li using her Street Fighter 2 costume in the Xism mode. The roster here is pretty expansive. Alpha 3 brings back a bunch of classic characters and introduces a bunch of new characters. Classic characters include E Honda, Kami, and Vega, while the new additions include characters like R Mika, Kareen, and another Final Fight edition with Cody. At the beginning of each character's playthrough, you get a nice little backstory blurb before it gets into it, and at the end, some really neat pseudo-animated artwork that tells some more story while the credits roll. While playing through the game, you get a handful of scenes with other characters that are a lot like the rival fight dialogue scenes from Alpha 2, but these don't seem to have any specific requirements and just exist as fun extra dialogue, which I enjoy a lot. In fact, I think this is a solid arcade experience that includes a lot more dynamic story elements than the previous entries. As a primarily solo player for these kinds of games, 
Legends, this is exactly the kind of thing that I'm looking for and it's much appreciated here. Alpha 3 is a sort of culmination of things taken from previous Alpha games and quite literally the entire series itself. It, at one point, was poised to be Capcom's swan song for the Street Fighter series, and I think they definitely would have gone out on a high note in this case. Alpha 3 is a solid game, and while it does feel like it's drowning among the sea of other similar games, it stands on its own as the last true Capcom Street Fighter game of the era. In a departure from previous entries in the EX series, Street Fighter EX3 skipped an arcade release entirely and came exclusively to the PlayStation 2 in 2001. So let's get this out of the way. I, uh, don't like this art style, and I don't know how to fully convey why. Like, just look at the characters, I guess? In the previous games, you could kind of excuse the looks, given that they were stylized and low-res thanks to the limited power of older generation hardware. But this time, it looks almost like they were going for more fidelity, but lost all sense of art direction on the way, and it, it just it doesn't work for me. On top of that, the presentation also leaves something to be desired, to say the least. The menus are incredibly basic, with few real transition scenes or animations. Not that every game needs flashy animations, but the Street Fighter series has already set kind of a high bar, so it's just disappointing to see for me personally. The gameplay here is similar to previous EX games, but of course makes some changes. First off, depending on the mode, you now have tag-in matches that work similarly to the ones that we saw in the Marvel crossover games. I'm not sure why they chose to do this, but unlike the Marvel games, it feels more like a tacked-on gimmick here. There is a decent team-up special move called a Critical Parade, though, and it can be used at the cost of two of your special gauges from two characters. One of the other big gameplay changes is guard breaks being removed in favor of a new surprise blow mechanic, which is kind of just a more powerful standard attack and doesn't cost any of your super meter. This game's best new feature, in my opinion, is the new character edit mode, which I would personally just call custom character mode. In this mode, you use Ace, a character who starts with very few moves. Beating missions in this mode as Taskmaster, I mean Ace, <laughs> gives him experience, which can be used to unlock more equipable moves, all of which are borrowed from other main characters. The missions are actually very similar to the Expert or Trial mode that we saw in previous EX games, but this time completing them gives you points toward the move shop. Ace can also be used outside of this mode, which gives you a real feeling of progression in an otherwise arcade-style game. A few other modes available in this game are in the Arena Battle mode, and they include Tag Battle, Dramatic Battle, and the Return of Team Battle. The one that I want to mention, though, is Dramatic Battle. It shares the same name as the Dramatic Battles that we saw in Alpha, and while it's similar in concept, I guess, it's way different in execution. It's just an arcade mode with tag-out characters and special bonus requirements, like getting to a certain number of hits or finishing the match in certain ways. Maybe I'm missing something, but when I think Dramatic Battles, this is not it. At least not in the way that we saw of Dramatic Battles previously, which is a bit disappointing. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't play as much of EX3 as I did of the last couple of EX games, or really any of the previous games. The changes here just feel disjointed, and the game didn't really bring a whole lot new to the table for me. It still feels fine mechanically, but it feels directionless, almost like a testbed for features to maybe be expanded upon in a future title that just never came. The tag-in mechanics don't feel like they're here because they were trying to push the envelope, but instead like they just wanted some way to make this entry different. EX3 is, to me, a misstep, and unfortunately the last we'd see of any new Street Fighter releases for a pretty long time. Additionally, this was the final Street Fighter EX game, but not technically the end of the EX series. Arika, I probably mispronounced that, the company in charge of these games, would continue the series in spirit with a couple of original titles featuring similar gameplay and some of the original Street Fighter EX characters. The newest entry, Fighting EX Layer, was released in 2018. As for the overall Street Fighter series, though, let's move ahead quite a few years. Street Fighter 4 is the grand comeback of the Street Fighter series after a decade and was originally released in 2008. In classic Street Fighter fashion, it received a variety of updates which were Super Street Fighter 4, Arcade Edition, and Ultra Street Fighter 4, along with ports and mobile spin-offs. The version I'm playing here is Ultra Street Fighter 4. Let's start with visuals. This is 3D like EX, but a little bit different in execution. Where EX leaned into the 3D to sort of emulate other 3D fighters at the time, Street Fighter 4's 3D is 3D in a way that may as well be 2D for gameplay purposes. No weird angle changes outside of special scenes and no dynamic camera movements during the fight. Character animations are really smooth too, but feel uniquely frame-based, like 2D animations. There's not always a smooth transition between movements and attacks, which sounds bad on paper, but makes the game feel so much more responsive in practice. The visual style is excellent too. It's sort of a clay model look mixed in with this stylized watercolor aesthetic in-game. While the graphic fidelity is a bit dated by modern standards, 
standards, it still looks perfectly good to me and the characters are expressive without going too far into cartoon territory. The presentation of the interface is nice and snappy too. One of my favorite details is how the characters now occlude the UI sometimes, putting it behind them during the cinematic sequences or even when they simply jump up above where the UI is. While this is probably for minimizing distractions, it's also a really cool stylistic choice too and I think they bring it forward in every future game. Oh, and speaking of the interface, this character select menu is massive! I'm not 100% sure, but I think this is the largest roster we've seen so far. 4's gameplay feels like it goes back to the basics in a lot of ways, which I totally understand given the length of time between this and the last major numbered release. There's no direct parrying, no air blocking, no alpha super combos or whatever, and the gameplay just feels simple, at least when it comes to the fundamentals. That doesn't mean that there's not some unique features though. Super attacks are back and use the standard super gauge, of course, but there's now an additional boosted super attack called an ultra combo. In ultra, every character has a choice between two ultra combos in the character selection screen or the option to choose both, albeit nerfed and damage output. Ultra combos can be activated by filling the revenge gauge, a new gauge that only fills when you take or block hits from the opponent. Once this gauge is full, you can initiate an ultra combo, which is a super cinematic special move that deals tons of damage. Because this is a fully 3D game, this is the first time Capcom themselves were able to create special move scenes with dynamic camera angles, and these look nice. They're not super long animations, but that makes them feel even more impactful when you just barely manage to pull one out. There's another big addition in the focus attacks. These are supplemental chargeable heavy attacks that you can initiate with any character, and they deal a solid hit and have this really neat ink blot effect when you fully charge them. While they can be risky to use, they're great for pushing through an opponent's offense, and if you use a red focus attack, you can even absorb enemy attacks while using it at the cost of some of your own super gauge. While it's not the only game to have done something like this, Ultra Street Fighter 4 does something really cool that almost renders every previous revision of Street Fighter 4 obsolete, and that's the addition select. When you select your character in offline modes, you have the option of choosing which version of the character that you want to use directly. No fuss, no weird button combinations, no isms, just a simple selection on the menu. Of course, you can only select an addition that your character was actually in, so characters added in later versions can only go back as far as that version. But there's one extra addition that you can select called Omega Mode. While I don't fully understand the intricacies of this mode, it apparently gives you a great offensive boost while also giving your opponent benefits as well. I actually like this addition select solely because of how straightforward it is. Sure, it's kinda similar to the whole ism thing from Alpha 3, but that was kind of hard to understand as a casual player without looking up the differences online because it was from entirely different games with different mechanics. With this, I know exactly what I'm choosing every time, and the versions of Street Fighter 4 didn't completely change all of the game mechanics every single time. Does that mean that I personally can take advantage of the balance differences? I am truly awful at fighting games, but I play them for you. Please subscribe. Ultra Street Fighter 4's modes are Arcade, Versus, Multiplayer, Challenge, and Training. Arcade mode is exactly what you'd expect, but the presentation is wonderful. Not only is there the addition of voice acting to the intro scenes, but there's even character-specific dialogue during some of the rival fights, and god, I love character-specific dialogue. But what's even cooler is that every character has a fully animated and voiced ending, like no holds barred full animations. I love this so much, and for them to go the extra mile like this is impressive. Animated scenes like this are one of my favorite gaming trends, and I got super giddy the first time I encountered one. It really makes the whole journey feel worth it with each and every character. Oh, and we've come back to punching cars and bonus stages. They've also made a tweaked version of the barrel mini game from the EX series as another bonus stage too, and I think that barrel mini game comes back in every future numbered game. They've brought back rival battles too, and this time each character has a unique cutscene with fully voiced dialogue and sometimes the characters even speak to each other during the fights. Again, I love character specific dialogue like this, so I actually intentionally lost a bunch of these fights. I just wanted to see the different scenes for the different characters. I promise I'm not that bad. Once you clear the rival battle, you're on to a two stage final battle with Seth. Clearing arcade mode unlocks costumes and taunts for your character which are selectable in most modes before the match starts. In challenge mode, there's trial, ultra trial, and bonus games from the arcade mode that are freely playable. Trial mode is actually the expert mode from the EX series brought forward again and works nearly identically. You select a character and perform their abilities with further and further complexity. The difference between trial mode and ultra trial mode is actually the version of the game that it's based on, with ultra trial featuring the characters and balance adjustments from Ultra Street Fighter 4. Playing this mode seems to unlock special icons for the character that you're using that can be used for your online profile card. Also, I attempted an online match here and could not get into one, just so you know. Street Fighter 4 was an explosive way to bring back the series, and I think Capcom really tried their best to make a game that could stand up to their 90s output. Did they succeed? I personally think so, but keep in mind that again, I'm more of a casual player. I do wonder how old school fans felt about this comeback though, and if you're one of those people, definitely let me know in the comments.
Remember when I played every Tekken game and the series director Harada tweeted out the videos? That's only tangentially related, but I'm still really giddy about it. Anyways, two Goliaths of the fighting game genre came together to bring a Street Fighter Cross Tekken in 2012 for consoles and PC. This game is Street Fighter's gameplay style with Tekken's roster sprinkled in. And let me tell you, while it sounds kind of ridiculous, it works really well on a fundamental level. So both visually and in basic gameplay, this game feels a lot like Street Fighter 4. They're the same sort of stylized look and everything, but in my opinion, with a much flashier presentation in the menus outside of the game and the effects in-game. Honestly, I kind of prefer this game's overall style due to the extra variety, but most people probably would consider it pretty equal to Street Fighter 4. This game, like previous crossovers, uses a tag team system. This means that you select two characters and you can swap between them in battle. Unlike the previous crossovers, though, the round is over when one character is KO'd. That means that in a two-round match, everyone starts with full HP at the beginning of the round. Things like team super combos are here, though, and they're called cross arts in this game. A brand new addition that seems to be unique to this game is supercharges. With these, you can take normal special moves like reuse Hadouken and hold down the input to charge them up. The longer you charge them, the more powerful they become, and if you're able to charge them long enough, they can turn into a super combo at zero cost to your super gauge. The trade-off here, though, is that the enemy can see it coming from a mile away from the time it takes to charge. Another change here, which I don't think is just my imagination, is the ease in which you can connect combos. It feels a lot like the timing to perform follow-up attacks has been loosened for this game specifically, and I found myself doing some pretty flashy combos with relatively little effort, almost like juggling the enemy, and that could be the Tekken influence given Tekken's juggling. The gameplay here mostly revolves around the new gem system, though. The way this works is that when you select your characters, you can also select a set of gems that give you different effects. There's a few different gems that are separated by their color, including some that passively increase stats like the speed and defense gems, while others like the assist gems can make special moves easier to perform. There's also some gems that can have secondary effects like raising a stat at the cost of reducing another. Some gems also require certain conditions to be activated in the battle, like landing a certain number of hits in a combo, blocking a certain number of attacks, or pulling off special maneuvers like reversals or EX specials. This gem system was definitely a controversial design decision to say the least. It's a neat idea conceptually, but it led to, in my opinion at least, the general muddying of the whole Street Fighter and Tekken crossover idea. I don't think the game needed a gimmick because the whole concept itself was already a gimmick. There's already the tag team system, let alone an entirely unique roster of Tekken characters adapted to a 2D Street Fighter gameplay style. They probably could have just left it there, especially since the basic Street Fighter game mechanics are already very solid. Anyways, now that I'm on the subject, let's talk about the roster for a second. First off, this is a massive roster when you include the DLC characters, and really, they knocked it out of the park with franchise representation. Street Fighters got characters from pretty much every iteration of the series in here, but obviously the big focus is going to be on Tekken characters. Some of the roster additions here are interesting. You have Kazuya, Heihachi, Xiaoyu, and of course... Kazuma Jin but also some of the roster additions were kind of interesting to say the least. You have Sony's cat mascots, you have Pac-Man who I guess pilots Mokujin as a mech suit, and for some reason Cole from Infamous is here? Anyways, those characters are cool and all, but the most important character is Mega Man and his objective best design and appearance to date. I polled my subscribers on the best Mega Man design and I think they must have mixed up the options because there's obviously one clear winner here. His inclusion as a joke character definitely wasn't an un intentional slap in the face to Mega Man fans coping with the imminent death of their beloved franchise or anything. Anyways, jokes aside, there really was a major issue with this roster. The guest characters are exclusive to the PlayStation version of this game for some reason. On top of that, while it's not something that'd make the news nowadays, this game came with the DLC characters already on the disc, meaning that you were functionally paying to unlock something that you technically already had in your possession. Anyways, to get into the modes, there's the arcade mode versus online play, training, challenge, and customize. On the surface, arcade mode is presented similarly to Street Fighter 4's at first, with a nice dynamic cutscene and full voiceover and everything. However, these scenes are only available if you're using specific pairs of characters. Otherwise, you get a different generic scene about the overarching story. I do wish that every character combination had their own scene, but that would probably be a monumental effort, and I totally get why it's done this way. And I can sort of forgive it, since as you progress through the mode, you run into the pairs who all have their own little scenes that are kind of like the rival battles in 4. Every opponent team you face 
face has their own unique character-specific dialogue, and while I don't have to say it again, I will. I love character-specific dialogue. Keep doing this, fighting games. I live for this stuff. At the end of the arcade mode, you get a really, really nice, fully rendered cutscene featuring your characters if you chose an established pair. If not, you get another generic scene followed by a text blurb about your primary chosen character. The versus mode in this game includes player versus player and player versus CPU matches, but also a brand new mode called Scramble Battle. Scramble Battle is complete chaos. This mode has all four selected characters on the screen at the same time with each duo sharing a single health bar. This is fun to watch, but actually playing it is pretty hard since it's so difficult to follow anything that's happening. I'm sure this would be a ton of fun against other players locally to shake it up though. The final thing I want to highlight here is the customize menu. This menu includes the gem editing mode where you can customize each character's gem loadouts and a sick color customization mode. Here you can choose colors for every piece of a character's outfit from their hair, their clothes, and even their skin. It's a bit of a gimmick, but it's definitely a way to add some more personality to your favorite characters, furthering the whole customization feel they were going for with the gems. So Street Fighter Cross Tekken is a really cool but flawed game. I think it's one of those games that really didn't get much of a chance to shine for a variety of reasons. While I could go into them here, I think Mad McMuscle's video on it is the absolute best way to see what happened. Hi, Cross Tekken was pegged to be a big seller by Capcom, but why wouldn't it be? I'll put a link to his video in the description, and you should definitely go check it out after this video if you're interested in an incredibly well-researched and an entertaining story on the matter. Also, just check out his channel in general. It's actually one of my favorite channels on YouTube. So this game was actually meant to be the first of two crossovers between these franchises. I'll bet you can guess what the second one was supposed to be. Yeah, Tekken Cross Street Fighter was actually in active development, and obviously was planned to be Street Fighter characters brought into Tekken's 3D fighting style. They even went so far as to promote the game, and people by all accounts seemed pretty stoked for it. Unfortunately, it's been over a decade at this point, and while it doesn't look like the game was ever officially fully cancelled, I think it's safe to assume that it's never coming out. We did kinda sorta get a Street Fighter cross Tekken if you count Akuma showing up in Tekken 7, I guess? Oh, and for those who are wondering why I didn't talk about this game in my Tekken videos, this, this is why. This, here, right here. Look, look at that. We, we did it! Street Fighter V was initially released on the PlayStation 4 and Windows PCs in 2016. V was the first main Street Fighter game to move away from the previous release format by using standard content updates and balance changes in the form of patches. While they did release later versions of the game, Arcade Edition and Champion Edition, as standalone titles, the changes and additions included in these versions were available as downloadable patch updates to the original version of the game. Alright, you probably guessed it, but we're gonna talk visuals first. This game's visual style is distinctly different from Street Fighter 4s in quite a few ways. First, it's more realistic, definitely, but still very stylized. In fact, the best way that I could describe it is that they cranked up the contrast on everything. There's a lot of focus on shadows and dark lines here, especially on the characters themselves. The characters themselves still have sort of a clay look to them like in 4, but the details are cranked up quite a bit. The overall presentation is kind of the first step toward the whole people are watching people play this in a stadium kind of look. It looks great though, and it's really clean, and it looks like they've taken some cues from basically every previous game in the series here too. If Street Fighter 4 was trying to be a brand new comeback for the series, Street Fighter 5 seems like it's trying to get you to remember the series and maybe honor it a little bit. Now for the gameplay, 5, unsurprisingly, feels incredibly solid and responsive to play. The basic mechanics are here, mixed in with some new stuff and some rebranded stuff brought back. As always, super combos are back, but this time called Critical Arts. There's a new special gauge in the form of the V gauge that fills over time similarly to 4's Revenge Gauge, or through the use of new abilities called V-Skills. When the gauge is filled up enough, you can activate a character's V-Trigger, a powered-up mode that has various effects depending on the character. While this changes their movesets a little bit, what's neat is that some characters also have a modified critical art if they've activated their V-Trigger before using it. There's other V-themed stuff that you can do too, like the V-Reversal, which is a sort of parry move that costs some of your V-Gauge. Five also took a new approach to character unlocks. In previous titles, new characters were introduced through completely new versions of the game. Here, you can unlock newly released characters through the in-game currency called Fight Money. The Fight Money system is, at least for the time it appeared in this game, a great concept that meant every character was unlockable without spending more real money. With everyone unlocked, there's a lot of characters here. New additions include characters like Ed, Abigail, Lara, and my favorite new addition, Rashid. Another thing about this roster is the sheer number of costumes available to these characters. It is far beyond what we've seen in any past game with its variety. You've got some nice no-brainer alternate costumes like Hot Ryu and Standard Nash. You've also got tons of cool throwbacks 
throwback outfits with older designs too. And then there's, you know, holiday themed outfits and wacky crossover outfits featuring throwbacks to other Capcom franchises like Devil May Cry and Mega Man. Pretty wild. Five's got a lot of modes, so I'm gonna do this a little bit out of order. First, there's the online play. You've got lobbies that you can join, casual matches, and ranked matches. You can also customize your profile here with your favorite character, titles, and some background cards. For the first time in this video, I'm gonna get to try an online match. I mean, I've been playing Street Fighter non-stop for weeks. I have to have gotten better, right? Thank God it's opposite day today. Am I always gonna be so bad at the game? I've gotta make it too, I take it all the way I cannot think it, all these players cannot make me lose all of my inspiration Practicing my movement and my specials and my Jamie drinking Throwing out the hot can I show them I can really make it Never let them tell you that you cannot rise up through the right And show them all the work you've done to be a newbie inspiration Even if I'm not the best at fighting for my inclination For a journey I can proudly share with you my Neo Nation Next up, we've got versus modes, which include player versus player and player versus CPU styles, including team battles. After that, there's the challenge modes. Here we've got trials, demonstrations, missions, extra battle, and survival. Most of these modes have extra benefits that you get for playing them, like fight money or items for the survival mode. Trials are back and work like they did in 4, but you can actually see a demonstration of the combo being performed to get a better idea of what it's supposed to look like, which for me is super helpful. Missions are a set of challenges that can be completed for fight money rewards in almost any other mode, and these challenges up update every week. After missions, we've got Extra Battle, which is a mode with various special battles with different win conditions, though when I played, all of them were just win the battle. When you complete enough battles in the selected category, you can unlock things like fortune tickets and special extra costumes for your characters. The downside, though, is that these battles all cost fight money to play, so you can't just grind these over and over without a cost. Finally, for the challenges, there's Survival Mode. In this mode, your goal is to win a set number of fights with one character and one HP bar that doesn't recover automatically between the fights. There's a twist, though. After every fight, you can forfeit some of your total score in exchange for special boosts. Some of them simply restore your HP or special gauges, while others can do things like double your score in the next fight. Additionally, you can earn items in other modes to use here, and these items have similar kinds of effects, but don't come at any cost to your score. The downside is that these items are finite and have to be manually obtained again outside of the mode. This is actually a really great spin on survival mode, especially since I've seen survival in countless other games countless times. Usually, it's just a straightforward survival mode mode where you recover a little bit of HP between rounds, but that's it. Here, there's a fun added layer of strategy involved, and it makes this mode feel way more than a novelty that you'll only try once, like in a lot of other games. I like this mode a lot, which I didn't expect going into it. Now that we're out of the challenge modes, next up there's the in-game shop mode. Here you can purchase things for both fight money and real money depending on the item. There's characters, stages, costumes, player titles, and a secondary shop called Fighting Chance. Fighting Chance is basically just a gacha mode where you can use your fight money to get a chance at unlocking exclusive items. You can use four fortune tickets that you earned in various other ways to get free pulls too. And of course, on top of this shop, you can also buy stuff directly from the platform storefront like Steam or the PlayStation Store. Alright, now we're finally on to the big ones, at least for me. Arcade mode and the story modes. Arcade mode is, well, arcade mode, but Street Fighter V's arcade mode is one of the most unique I've ever seen. You can choose which Street Fighter era that you want to play, with the choices being Street Fighter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and Alpha. The mode that you choose affects a bunch of things, including the characters that you can select, the characters that you can fight, the music that you hear, and even whether or not you get bonus stages. I'll use the Street Fighter Alpha section as an example. The character select is Alpha characters. The music that you hear in the character select, between rounds and victories and everything, is all rearranged brand new versions of the same songs from Alpha. And the ending that you get for your character? Specific to Alpha, with a really slick comic book aesthetic. This also means that some characters have multiple endings if they show up in multiple games, and depending on which area you choose, have a different ending every time. And of course, the boss even changes depending on the era, so if you're doing Street Fighter 3, you face Gil as the final boss. I love this so much. It's not only a way to make the arcade mode a more dynamic and replayable experience, but also it honors all of the games that came before. When I said that 5 leaned more into honoring the series as a whole, this is one one of the main factors that made me feel that way. I didn't grow up as a hardcore Street Fighter fan, but I imagine that this had to have been really special for those who did. Five's arcade mode has officially dethroned Street Fighter 3's arcade mode for me as my favorite so far. Now on to the story modes. There are technically two story modes in this game, the individual character stories and a larger scale story mode called A Shadow Falls. A Shadow Falls is actually the first real full-fledged story mode in a mainline numbered Street Fighter game. It's got full cutscenes with voice acting and plenty of fights as a variety of characters, and 
for a fighting game story mode that isn't super long, this thing's actually pretty cutscene heavy. I went into it expecting it to just be a string of fights with some short scenes between them, and I came out pleasantly surprised. The general story is set between Street Fighter 3 and 4, and has the heroes dealing with a big worldwide threat that, of course, involves M. Bison being all evil and stuff. I personally am not invested in the overarching story of Street Fighter in general, but I really did enjoy finally seeing these characters in full cutscenes with some breathing room. The story was generally entertaining, too, and didn't take itself too seriously most of the time. Of course, I mentioned the individual character stories, and these are standalone, smaller scale stories that are available for every single character. These aren't super long, usually around 10 to 15 minutes each with a small handful of fights, but the fun, fully voiced and illustrated scenes are really charming, and there's some nice character moments sprinkled in on the way. Would I recommend buying this game just for the story modes? Probably not. If you're someone like me who prefers the single player content in fighting games, you'll probably have a great time with it, but I don't think that necessarily is the main appeal, at least not in the way that it's packaged in 5. Would I recommend Street Fighter V as a full package itself? Oh, 100%. I'll probably sound like a broken record here, but Capcom has a great track record with making every numbered Street Fighter installment feel unique in its own way, and I really love how 5 has a lot of fresh ideas but continues to honor the previous games. Nothing feels gimmicky or tacked on, and ditching the old release strategy of having six different versions of the game is refreshing too. I like Street Fighter V a lot. We're finally here. Street Fighter VI was released in 2023. Let's start with the presentation. The overall theme actually takes a lot from Street Fighter III Third Strike with its industrial and hip-hop influences, but with an extra dash of neon color. What's cool is that there's a clear stylistic divide between the three major modes that the game is broken up into. I'll explain the modes later, but the World Tour mode has the full-on graffiti look, Battle Hub's got a much more clean, modern look, and Fighting Ground has a focus on the bright neon sign aesthetic. The visual style itself is quite a departure from the previous games in a lot of ways. It is a lot more realistic, bordering on going for a photo real look, which you can especially see in the characters' faces. This means that every character has a human-like quality to them, but they're still a tiny bit stylized overall. I'd say that while they don't quite look like real human people, if you squint, you could definitely believe that they were. Like, Street Fighter V doesn't look cartoony in a vacuum, but if you put it up next to six, it absolutely does by comparison. Moving on to the stages, though, these these are stunning from a sheer beauty perspective. In fact, they did not have to go so hard on some of these stages. My favorite has to be the Genbu Temple stage because of the unique angle they went for with the falling cherry blossoms, the littered arches kind of extending into the background, and just the overall style. But every stage really is a work of art in its own way. Another huge stylistic change, which happens to be one of my favorite touches, is how they've made it feel like you're straight up a spectator in your own matches. There's a pre-match walkout in some of the modes, there's a live commentary option, and the overall all renewed expressiveness of the characters makes every match feel like an event, more so than any previous game. Oh, and it's all undercut by the ability to change your character's expression in the pre-match screen, which also means that you can just shift through the faces really fast to look extra goofy. Speaking of in-match commentary, while you're fighting, it simulates a voice commentating your match like it's an esports event. There's a few commentators to choose from, and there's options outside of just English, too. In general, I think this game has one of the strongest overall presentations in the entire series. The menus are clean, responsive, beautiful to look at and just makes sense. The in-game visuals are solid and pretty realistic and still look really good for a, you know, fighting game, and the style sets itself apart from any previous entry in the series, something that each numbered title has succeeded in doing. The gameplay in Street Fighter VI kinda sorta changes depending on the mode that you're playing, so let me start with the fundamentals that you'll see in the versus matches in online play. For starters, this game has introduced a completely new input option called Modern Controls. This option makes inputs for combos and special moves significantly easier across the board for every single character, but at a cost. Using modern controls makes some standard attacks not possible to use, but the even bigger trade-off is that specials, while super easy to pull off, deal less damage than their classic mode counterparts, let alone standard punches and kicks. That being said, the trade-off seems fair since modern controls can still overtake classic controls any day in the hands of an experienced player. And the modern control scheme isn't just a gimmick here, it actually seems like Capcom really wanted to make this game accessible to newer or less advanced players. It looks like that worked too. Not only are people actually using the modern controls, they're even using them online, and from what I can see, with relative success sometimes. This is a very welcome addition to the series in my opinion, and I think that fighting games really can seem scary to newcomers when the skill ceiling is just super high. Anything that lowers that perceived barrier to entry without sacrificing what makes it special to older fans only helps the genre. Of course, the modern controls have had their share of controversy, but a majority of the sentiment that I've seen since launch has been positive, so I think modern controls are probably here to stay. Getting into the specific 
great gameplay mechanics. The special gauge returns and functions as a normal gauge this time, but there's now the addition of a second gauge called the drive gauge, and I'd argue that the drive gauge is more important than the special gauge in 6. The drive gauge is used for a bunch of new drive features, mainly drive impacts, drive parries, drive rushes, drive reversals, and overdrives. While some of these have kind of sort of existed in some form in the past, they're all tied together with a really pleasing freeform paint aura aesthetic that surrounds your character completely in, you know, paint. It actually feels like it's a callback to Street Fighter 4's focus attacks, and if that's intentional, it's a really cool touch. So drive impacts use some of your drive gauge to completely break through the opponent's offensive to deal a staggering blow. Drive parries are basically an enhanced guard that slowly zaps your drive gauge over time when you hold the button, but if an opponent hits you while you parry, you not only block the attack, if it's not a grab, but you regain some of your drive gauge in the process. A drive reversal is another type of parry, but this one uses up drive gauge bars to perform a follow-up punishing attack against the opponent. A drive rush is usable immediately after a parry, and it gives you a directional sidestep. Finally, overdrive is similar to an EX move, but it uses the drive gauge instead of the special gauge, and it does less damage. The drive gauge also has one additional mechanic in the form of burnout, a state that you go into if you completely deplete the gauge. It's not quite like a stun, but it does make you a lot more vulnerable and almost completely unable to defend yourself. Moving on to the character roster, this starting roster is a bit smaller than I'm used to seeing, but this game also just came out as of this recording, so it's not a bad thing or anything. They did add in a few newcomers, though, and this might be one of my favorite new casts so far. Marissa, a gladiator-inspired warrior. Manon, whose moveset is super smooth and basically integrates ballet movements into the fighting stances. JP, a new big bad who's way cooler than Bison, in my opinion. And my favorite new addition, Jamie, who has this really cool drunken fist style mechanic and is super fun to play. But I'm also really bad at him, so that's magical. But of course, the classics are here. You have Ryu, Chun-Li, and Punished Ken. They have changed how new DLC characters are unlocked from 5, though, since fight money's gone. These characters now have to be unlocked simply by paying real money for them. That being said, they have added a system in the game for unlocking these trial tickets, which let you use characters that you don't own one time in exchange for the ticket. This is probably a nice way to test drive a character if you're on the fence about buying them. Unfortunately, I can't actually show you this mechanic because the first DLC character, Rashid, doesn't come out for another two weeks from the time that I'm recording this. Alright, so the modes in this game are kind of hard to just list off since they're separated into different categories, but I'll do my best to try to cover the major stuff. Let's start with arcade mode, the tried and true classic. This time they basically merged the arcade mode with the character story modes. It's got per character intros and endings that are fully voiced, and all of them are accompanied by some pretty beautiful artwork along the way. For the final battle, you get special dialogue between you and your rival, a touch that isn't unique to this game, but one that I still love. And yeah, that's kind of it. I like this arcade mode, though. It doesn't have the depth of fives, but it's not really trying to. It works as a nice supplemental mode to get some lore on the characters and see where they stand, actually. Also, the artwork reminds me a lot of Soul Calibur 6's story mode, and I enjoyed that story mode quite a bit, too, so this is a welcome look. The arcade mode isn't too in-depth, though, but, uh, that's not really a problem, given that the World Tour mode exists. World Tour mode is hands down the reason to buy this game if you're on the fence. I haven't even told you what the mode is yet. That's how good it is. In this mode, you use a custom avatar that you create in a fully explorable metro city with access to other smaller locations a bit further in. The character is customizable at the beginning with character creation, followed by being able to buy all kinds of gear that you can get from the in-game shop using in-game currency. While the gear does have stats attached to it, you have the option of putting any cosmetic gear over it without affecting your stats too. Speaking of stats, you can actually level up in this mode, and as you gain experience, you can increase your attributes using skill points. Yeah, it's basically an RPG. But here's the best part of the mode. Metro City is full of NPCs walking around, going about their day and minding their own business, and you can challenge almost every single one of them to a fight that begins seamlessly exactly where you're standing, with other actual NPCs spectating in the background. I cannot emphasize enough just how fun and novel this single game mechanic is. It never gets old. Plus, your character learns moves throughout the game that can be used outside of battles to initiate them, and these can be used to completely blindside someone just minding their own business. You can just punch them in the back of the head. There's also enemies who will chase and attack you if they see you too. All of the NPCs have a level, and while you can challenge any NPC of any level, challenging an NPC of a way higher level will usually be a lot tougher. Fortunately, you can supplement yourself with items that restore your HP or boost your stats during battles. Most opponents also have little extra optional battle missions that you can undertake, which give you bonuses in the form of money and extra items. This mode involves the main Street Fighter cast in the story, but also in the form of a mentoring system called Masters. You start out with Luke as your mentor, and you're given a couple of his special moves, and as you progress through the story, you meet more and more of the main cast and can be mentored by them too. You can take on everyone as a master, but you can only have one of their stances and movesets equipped at a time. Equip 
Equipping the stance changes your character's in battle stance and abilities to match the masters. You build relationships with these mentors through using their abilities in battle and fighting other NPCs who use their stance. As you increase a master's rank, you get access to even more of their abilities and special training battles with them too. Listen, there's a lot to this world tour mode, and it alone makes Street Fighter VI a game that I highly recommend to even the most casual fighting game fan. I think this mode can appeal to basically every kind of fighting game player from the most hardcore competitive players all the way down to casuals like me. It's some of the most fun single player content I have ever experienced in a fighting game. But of course, there are more modes. Extreme Battle Mode has rules and gimmicks. The rules and gimmicks can be mixed and matched too. Rules include Down and Out, a mode where you have to be the first to get five knockdowns on the opponent, Back and Forth, a rule where HP bars are replaced by one big tug of war meter, and Rules and Regulations, where you have to perform the actions on the screen faster than the opponent. The gimmicks are a bit more broad, like Bull Run, which randomly has a bull stampede through the stage like a Smash Brothers hazard, or Lucky Drones, which when you break them can have various effects, like even changing some of your rules and regulations challenges. There's a few online modes here, obviously, and while you can just play standard matches, there's also an entire new explorable hub for your avatar called the Battle Hub. This is basically just a lobby, but you can see and interact with other players in real time. It's really neat sitting down at an arcade machine and another player just walks up and challenges you in real time. On top of that, you can sit down at these separate machines to play some old actual arcade games through emulation, including stuff like Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. There's an added new clan system called Clubs, and anyone can make a club and customize it or join a pre-existing club. If you create a club, you can customize the title, slogan, banner, and even some tags to show what your club is all about. I made a club called Where's Heihachi because, I mean, where is he? I then proceeded to give the club some inconsistent imagery and called it a day. Club established. Where's Heihachi? Since this is a modern video game, of course there's a battle pass system with a free tier and a premium tier that rewards you with things like cosmetics for your world tour avatar, profile customization goodies, and even more classic arcade games to add to your collection. Since this video was recorded during the lead up to Rashid's release, the battle pass rewards are Rashid themed. If Street Fighter 4 was reintroducing the series and Street Fighter 5 was paying respect to the series, then I'd say that Street Fighter 6 is reinventing the series. There's so many new ideas here, and I personally believe that all of them worked out. This game, like all of the others, sets itself apart in so many ways, and it feels fresh and new and good to play. I think this one will absolutely go down as one of the best fighting games to hit the market yet, and I hope that other fighting games in the future take some cues from Street Fighter 6, especially when it comes to single-player content like World Tour. If you're someone who isn't super interested in online play or the competitive aspect of games like this, but still like to casually play a fighting game every once in a while, World Tour mode itself is basically a whole game. So I think every numbered Street Fighter game has its own identity and its own things that it does that sets it apart from what came before. I don't know if it's recency bias or just because of how many new things it does, but out of all the Street Fighter games I played, 6 is probably my favorite overall package, and that actually extends to the non-numbered titles too. But again, these games all do something different and have certain qualities that can't be found in the others. Like, I'd bet Street Fighter 7 will probably ditch the drive gauge or at the very least rename it to something else and focus more on a brand new system instead. And you know what? That's perfectly fine because it's been fun learning how all these new mechanics work, especially as someone who usually can't wrap my brain around special move inputs, let alone complex fighting game systems. Now you might say, Neo Sai, you didn't cover the Final Fight games. You didn't actually play every Street Fighter game. There's Street Fighter 2010, Duel, Puzzle Fighter, and even Final Fight. Well, you see, to address all of those things, Final Fight is an iconic series on its own, and thus I think it actually deserves its own video, which I will do eventually. While those other games do share a lot with Street Fighter, they aren't what I'd consider Street Fighter games for the purposes of this video. Same goes for stuff like Super Puzzle Fighter and even Marvel vs. Capcom, which I mentioned earlier. And to add to that, there are a couple of little Street Fighter spin-offs that have Street Fighter in the name but aren't really Street Fighter games, at least not in the way that makes sense in the context of this video. Sorry, all the Street Fighter 2010 fans out there, I promise I'll cover that one some other time. Finally, I want to reiterate once again that I'm a very casual fighting game player, and this was a pretty daunting two videos to make because of that. While I spent a ton of time researching these games and did my absolute best to include as accurate information about the game mechanics as I could, I know that there's probably some stuff that I missed or even got wrong. If that's the case, I'm totally open to corrections in the comments and stuff. Just go easy on me, please. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this video. I know it took a while to come out, but hopefully you can see why when you look down at that video length. This was a blast to make, though, and I feel like I learned a lot, and I have a much bigger appreciation for fighting games now. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel, because this is the kind of content that I make all the time. It's my bread and butter, and I plan on releasing a ton more of these as long as I possibly can. Also, let me know in the comments what kinds of games you want to see me cover in the future. I still dedicate time every single day.
full day to reading comments. It's almost guaranteed that I'll at least see your suggestion. I also really want to thank my patrons, including Nats Ash and Cup Meg and the Played Every Game tier, along with all of these awesome, wonderful people that you see on your screen. Thank you so much for the support. Alright, thank you so much for watching, and as always, have a fantastic day.